I'd like to give my condolences and send my condolences to my believing brothers and sisters and especially to our master, Al Hujat ibn Al Hassan, being tonight the commemoration of the demise of his grandmother and the wife of his grandfather, Rasulullah as Sayyid Khadija alayhi salam. And also give you all my condolences. May Allah increase and augment your reward for your patience with the perpetual attacks that take place against the Muslims most recently the attack in Kuwait and this is one of and the main reason why in my introduction I send the damnation and I call upon Allah to damn those that played any part in the martyrdom of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. The same mentality. People that were involved collectively to kill a man for no reason at all in the most devastating manner, in the most horrific manner, only to please someone or to accept and answer someone's request. There was no other purpose. There was no other purpose. In fact, in some of the narrations that you hear that even where one of the soldiers had been killed of the enemy and next to them was, uh, uh, in some, it's, it's, it's mentioned in this kind of manner, mixed, me, next to them was a handful of dates. And the fourth Imam, Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam, says to his auntie Zainab that see this handful of dates this is how much this man was paid to be involved in the massacre of my father Abu Abdullah Hussein. something so measly meager of little or no value they involved even in Iraq there was a bombing the person captured this was in Baghdad that placed the bomb between these innocent people. If you watch the video on YouTube, they are interviewing him. They say, why did you place that bomb there? He said, I was paid. And you think, wait, how much was he paid? He says, Warak, I was given 100 US dollars. Not because of the money, the reason and the purpose behind this hatred that they have, and this arrogance that they have is there are two types of people before we get to the third. There's those that sell their dunya and they want the akhirah. They, they throw away this world to purchase the next world. Then there are those, and this will be brought up in a discussion in this month. Then there are those that trade their akhirah for the dunya. And they are the worst the, the, the bad type of people. But the worst type of people are the ones that trade their akhirah for someone else's dunya. You know, they do someone else's bidding. They do someone else's ask or someone else's task. You know, that's why I never ever feel sorry for an American black ops operation. You know, those that get sent out somewhere in the middle of some South American forest and they're told, that if you're captured, we'll deny that you exist. To hell with them. Why would I want to die for someone? Why would I want to be involved in something for somebody else to get richer? So these people that were involved in the explosion in Kuwait yesterday, during the Friday prayers, these people that did this, or the main person, the suicide bomber, that was involved, was just there to answer someone's request, to make someone achieve a better political position. This is why we send the damnation of Allah. We say, oh Allah, damn these people. Remove your mercy from them and place them in the fire of hell. Because of all the pain and agony that they bring people with their murder of innocence. Now, before we speak a little about Sayyida Khadija, I would just like to finish last night's discussion when it came to being content. 
And we said that the muttaqi is someone that has little needs. They have scanty needs. They're not someone that likes to be extravagant or excessive. The last mention we made is it makes you grateful. You have gratitude. You're thankful of whatever little that you have. The people would go to Mina, and they're sorry, people would go to Hajj. And this was the only time, and this is the main reason why I always tell people to go to Hajj if they're capable of. The reason I tell people to go to the Hajj is the only time you will be with a guarantee that you are in the presence of your Imam al hujjat ibn al Hasan al Mahdi. And you will be walking where he is. He will be in your midst. For that is suffices just for you to go. Now, people would go to the Hajj in order to see the Imam of their time because they were not capable of seeing the Imam because of the tyrannical rule that surrounded and that would not allow them. And a man walked in and said to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, give me. I am in need. And they say there was some fruit next to the Imam and he took some grapes and he gave him some grapes. And the man said, I'm not in need of grapes. You know, I'm not in need of grapes. That's why in Islam, when it comes to corporal punishment in an Islamic state, in a proper Islamic state, we're not talking about Daesh, in a proper Islamic state, under the rule of a sinless Imam that is appointed by God, in that situation, someone that steals in need is different to someone that steals without need. For example, if someone was to steal food in an Islamic state because they need to eat. You know, in, in Britain, just at, at this point, before they used to send convicts here, back in the, um, the, t the turn of the um, 18th century, just before... Uh, Captain Arthur Philip landed here in 1788. Before that, what they would actually do is they would execute people that would steal. They would execute you for stealing a comb. And these are things. And they would hang people. And I actually googled this recently. It doesn't exist. They've removed this. This is what we were taught in Australian public schools. But you can't find it in Google. That they would hang four and five year old children for stealing bread to eat. We were taught this in our public schools, okay? That they would hang children, but I was looking it up on Google, I couldn't find it. So if someone can ever get this information, it'd be nice to find the textbooks, probably in, in libraries can find it, but this is what they used to do. They used to hang people that wanted to eat. In Islam, there is no Corporal punishment for someone that steals because they want to eat. The punishment is upon those that steal for the, for the sake of stealing. You know those ones that do it for an adrenaline rush or those that want something because it is better. This is where the punishment falls upon them. So when I ask, I will take anything I'm given. When we say beggars can't be choosers, anything that you're given, you take. Because you're asking. So the Imam puts forward some grapes and this person obviously is someone that doesn't want grapes. You know, he wants papers. This guy wants money. He doesn't want grapes. So he turns them away. And the Imam says, this is what I've put to offer you. You can take it. Man says, no one leaves. The next man moves in and says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I need, give me. And the Imam gives him the grapes and he takes them. He says, Oh Allah, what is it that I have done to be worthy to take grapes from the hand of the son of Rasulullah? He was content to get just that small amount. And the Imam continues to give him and he keeps thanking Allah. And he continues to give him from one thing to the other, fruit, money, what, whatever he's been given for his gratitude. And this is in general life. Those that show gratitude are the ones that are treated differently. That's why when you see 
two children with different treatment in a family, the one that's more grateful is given that preferential treatment generally. The next point when it comes to being content, it gives you firstly al-qana'atu tajtama' ila siyanatu nafs the first thing it says siyanatu nafs it gives you what? when you have qana'a you have that self-preservation that protection for yourself that when you're content because you have reached that point where you're needless you don't want you only turn to Allah you don't need to go out and about just to make you know the extra corn in order to um, uh, better your life the next point it says al qadr this means it gives you prestige it gives you honor and it gives you and it gives you might in another tradition it says tamaratul qana'a al az that the fruit of contentment is might and honor that you're honorable because you won't grovel to get something if you look at those that in order to get an extra dollar they truly lower their guard and they bring themselves down when they're around people so it gives you this honor and it gives you this might in another tradition when it speaks of this it says لن توجد القناعة حتى يفقد الحرص that in order for me to have contentment I cannot be someone that has this someone that has this hurs. in other words someone that you know those people that uh, I don't want to get too offensive but there's people that are avid you know the niggardly people there's, there's, hold on. you know there's those that hide their wealth and hoard their wealth it keeps you away from being so stingy okay and keeping your wealth away because you're content when you have this contentment you don't hide everything and lock yourself away from the world you're content with what is being given to you you don't have this need to store uh, the salt, salt or, or, or whatever saw something away for that rainy day now another thing when it comes to qana'a it says man qana'a hasunat ibadatuh whoever has qana'a whoever is content their worship is better why? because they're not preoccupied with making a dollar they're not worried about making that extra dollar so when they worship they worship and it's easy for them. They're not worried about, oh no. You know, I used, to, I used to remember people that have, like used to work on the cab. I'm not specifically picking on cab drivers. But people that used to work on the cab, and if they want to pray, they keep the radio in within ears range. So if there's a job available, they can jump on it. That is theirs. Or those that work with the stock market, or, or sorry, work with the dollar, they have it next to them even on the prayer mat because they're, too preoccupied with knowing what's going to happen but if you're not too preoccupied with worrying about your job and worrying about your money and you have contentment and if it's mine I'll take it no one else is going to take it then your worship is given better attention now when you look at contentment in general it is wealth not only does it give you that self-preservation, not only does it make you better in your worship, not only does it make you needless because you don't need to grovel before others, but contentment is wealth in itself. There was once a man, they say he was near the seaside or, or, or riverside and he was um, you know, putting his hand in water and fishing for kelp you know the like seaweed and that he was actually putting his hand in to get seaweed not for fish now one of the servants of the sultan came past and looked at him and said what are you doing 
he said, I'm getting some kelp, you know, seaweed. Basically, that's the stuff you eat when you're eating sushi, the seaweed that they use to make the that green cover thingy. So anyway, so when he was getting the kelp or the seaweed, the servant of the sultan said, why are you looking for this? He said, come and work with the sultan. You come and work with the sultan and you won't need to eat kelp. And then this man turned and looked at him. He said, but if I eat kelp, I will be in no need of the sultan. In other words, if I take this little, the moral of the story, I will not be in need of anyone. I won't have to grovel. I won't need to polish anyone's shoes. I won't need to beg anyone. When I'm content, I can deal with people on a normal basis. Not this guy's rich, so I'm going to give him more respect. Not this guy's poor, so why he's not going to affect me in life. On the contrary, I will sit with the rich, I will sit with the poor, I will talk nicely to everybody, because they will make no effect upon my life. A content person, as we read in Dua, um, uh, uh, Dua bi Hamza Thamali, where he says at the end of it, وَرَضِّنِي مِنَ الْعَيْشِ بِمَا قَسَمْتَ لِي because if you're pleased with whatever, make me pleased with whatever you have placed for me to have. Whatever Allah has placed for you to get as sustenance. If I get this, then I'm needless of anyone. If I rely solely on this, then I can deal with everyone normally. One of the worst things that rich people suffer from is they can't find friends. Because everyone around them is just there to see how much money they can leech off them. Everyone when they go to, you see someone when they become famous. I used to remember when we were younger and there'd be someone who would buy a new car. The next day you see him, he rocks up and he's got four new friends in the car. It happens. Four new friends in the car because now they're his friends. You know, isn't that, you know, isn't that weird that we became best friends after you purchased this car? Or you know where that guy that won the 181 million pound lotto. It's, it's funny, it's an article, write this in Google, it's funny. It says, man wins lotto and finds true love on the same day. It actually says that. They've actually written that. On the same day he found true love. Subhanallah. <laughs> this is what happens. That when I have wealth, when I have all these things, life changes around me. But when that's not the criteria, then I can deal with everybody normally. I can talk to the billionaire and I can talk to the impoverished in the same manner. Because I do not look at either of them being any benefit to me other than Allah. So it gives you wealth. You have that wealth in that position. Now, how do I make my needs scanty? How do I worry about having little? Now, don't think for a second, and I'll explain this as I conclude with this point, that I'm telling you that you have to live like a poor person. This is not what I'm saying. Your needs have to be scanty. When I say your needs have to be scanty, this does not mean I have to have less. That means if I have 20 houses, I'm just happy with the house I'm living in. That's what I should have in my head. The others are there, alhamdulillah. The second they go, alhamdulillah. I'm happy because I've got a home to put my head on. A home that well, I can um, uh, sleep in. And the proof of this, look at all these people that have properties. And they have land and they have wealth and they're always complaining. The majority of the most people I see, I've sat with and heard complain are usually people with money. They always complain. You know what? The hot water system that I bought from Germany that costs so many thousands of dollars, it's not working that well. Use a heater, mate. You know, light a fire. These are things people used to live before. 
You know, they're, 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 or, or their third world problem, uh, the first world problems. You know, something so simple. Uh, something that, uh, sorry, something that's not so complex or, or a problem that they've made for themselves that they don't need to have. And they complain and whinge about just about everything. When if they were content, they wouldn't care. I remember there was a man and someone sold him a faulty fridge. Um, he's, he's a relative of one of my friends. And he said, um, he, it, my, my friend said, I was sitting with him and he was laughing. And this man was content. How? He goes, when he was laughing, he said, he said, what are you laughing at? Someone just ripped you off. He said, I'm laughing at how this guy would stoop so low and lie and sell something just to make a small amount of money. You know, he'd look at it in that manner. He would look at it in, from that image, from that perspective, rather than think to himself that, uh, oh, I got ripped, I got killed. No, that's life and just moves along and does not give it any consideration whatsoever. Now, no rational person can chase money for money's sake. Who here likes money because of money? People like money for what money can do. The power of money, how it can manipulate people. When I have scanty needs, this is why I will not chase money. When my uh, needs become so little, and I'm content with so little, I realize I don't need that extra money. Any extra money I get will be spent on anything. When my needs become little, then my worries become far, far less. The other thing that it, when it comes to being content is that I can easily gain Allah Azza wa Jal's pleasure. In a narration it says, Man radiya min Allah bil yaseer min al ma'ash radiya Allahu minhu bil yaseer min al amal. And this is the best hadith out of all the ones I've read. I love this hadith. It says that if you are pleased from Allah and you accept from Allah even when you get a small amount of livelihood or subsistence then Allah will be pleased with a very small amount of good actions that you do. And that's what I suffer from. I do a very small amount of good actions. So I'm happy here. This is a bargain. So I might as well be happy with whatever Allah has given me. This is the benefit of contentment. However, like I said, this does not mean that I have to live like an impoverished person. This does not mean I have to cut myself away from the world. This just means that I'm content with whatever my situation is. Now back to the point surrounding Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam. Sayyida Khadija was the first wife of the Prophet and the most beloved of his wives. And also the most oppressed of his wives. In the sense that she is not recalled and remembered as she should be. She is the only wife of the Messenger of Allah. Rasulullah, all the women that he married were Thayyib, except for her. They were all divorcees and they were all widows. Rasulullah wasn't as he is depicted by people. He wasn't a player moving from one woman to another as they try and depict him. Rasulullah married divorcees in order to allow them or give them the possibility of living. He married widows. In fact, in the case of the daughter of Umar al Khattab, Hafsa, in her case, when she was given to the Prophet, she was put forced upon him to marry. In other words, how? When Omar offered her to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr did not want her. They say she wasn't attractive. So he didn't want any interest in her. Then he offered her to Uthman. Uthman didn't want a peace. And who was left? Rasulullah was left with this. Rasulullah was this type of person in his benevolence and being a benign prophet. He married her. As for the only wife that he took that was young and, and not married previously, that was Khadija. 
I know we get the stories of one being four or five or six years old, but she's the only one that claims this. She's the only one. It's like a bit like the, the, the Pele saga. You know how you always hear Pele used to score 1,000 goals in his career? If you research it, he's the only one that claims this. There's no evidence this guy ever scored 1,000 goals in 10 years. But he claims it and everyone just accepted it. Another thing that we all accept, people that have seen the movie Bloodsport, the one that movie for Jean-Claude Van Damme, which is based upon a guy called Frank Dukes, who used to be involved in this thing called the Comité. This is also made up. This doesn't even exist. This guy said that he had the fastest punch ever recorded. They didn't have speed guns back in the 70s. You know what I mean? But people actually believed it because people have this thing, if someone's a good enough fish storyteller, you know, someone's a good rocket launcher, he comes out and tells you a story, people automatically used to believe and they listen, but now we are more wary. And that's why we keep our windows open so the rockets fly out during some gatherings. Now this is what happens in this, in this manner where she said that I was six. And this is why they call the Prophet sub, such bad terms as they do on, um, by, the, by the people that are averse to the Prophet. Because she says I was four and the Prophet lifted up my dress, God forbid. And then she says I was six and the Prophet married me. I was nine, he consummated the marriage while I was playing with my toys. It sounds like something out of, you know, some uh, Mr. Bubbles or Robert Dolly Dunn's um, diary or something like that. Dead set. When you're listening to something like this, you go, wow. However, she was 24 years old, according to narrations, and she was divorced. As for Sayyida Khadija, alayhi salam, she was untouched. But when Rasulullah wants to show the position of Khadija, take a look at the position between Khadija and the other. The other one, when it comes to honesty and integrity, this is narrated by Sahih Bukhari. When we speak about Khadija and Rasulullah, when they ask him, why do you love her so much? He says, Khadija was the one that believed in me. When no one would believe, she believed. She believed me. As Bukhari, when he narrates about the specific woman in question, he says here in Bukhari that when Rasulullah says to her, I know when you're happy from me and I know when you're upset from me. He says, when you are happy from me, you say, by your Lord, O Muhammad. Muhammad. But when you're not happy with me, could you imagine the wife of the Prophet not being happy with the greatest creation of Allah, the one that says, Ana, says khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. The best of you, Rasulullah says, the best of you is the one that is best with their wife. They are the best. And he says, when I am the best with my wife, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi well, Ali Wasallam says he is the best, he is the best mannered. And he says that when you're upset with me, you say to me, by, your, by the Lord of Ibrahim. In other words, tukfur bin Abut. In other words, your prophethood doesn't exist. I swear by the prophethood of Ibrahim. As for Khadija alayhi salam, Rasulullah says she is the one that believed in me. When everyone called him a liar, everyone had called him a fabricator, everyone had called him a madman, she stood by him. And it was by the support of the wealth of Khadija that Islam was propagated. Islam was propagated through three supports. Two that are for another discussion, one being the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. One being the protection of Abu Talib, giving protection to the Muslims. And the third being the wealth of Khadija. And she did not give one or two dirhams or dinars. She gave her entire wealth for Islam. Everything, let it serve its purpose in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. She turned in this manner, not like these ones we mentioned, these gold diggers, that marry a guy or go after a guy when he has money. 
she finds an honest man and she sees that this man is righteous she gives all her money in order for the religion to be propagated she is the one that from her the progeny of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam extends from Khadija alayhi salam her demise was such a great event that Rasulullah in the year that she passed away and in the year in the same year Abu Talib alayhi salam passed away he called it the year of grievance or the year of grief this is the year where we weep because this is the year where he had two major losses and Khadija the ultimate evidence is the fact the same woman in question would always say things about her she says I was not jealous of a woman like I was jealous of Khadija why would she be so jealous because of the love that Rasulullah had for Khadija he never forgot her after she passed away that love was there forever because of who she was as a person and what she put forward for Islam and the manner in which she dealt with the Messenger of God. That she gave everything she had because she was content just to be the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.